Hi, everybody. I'm Katie Burtwell of the Walpole Historical Commission with another episode of Stories of Historic Walpole. So join me in the countdown to Walpole's 300th anniversary with Great Fires, part one. Long before Walpole had a permanent fire department, like many towns, it relied on on-call volunteer firefighters. Now, these volunteer firemen, and I don't think there were any fire women, not back in the 50s and 60s, but if I'm wrong, let me know. Um, the volunteers were alerted to fires by whistles located at the center of town, South Walpole and East Walpole. Kendall, Bird, and the other big businesses in town had their own fire whistles and their own fire brigades in-house. Um, but when they weren't using them, um, they just used it to signal shift changes. So Walpole used to have a lot of whistles going off at all times of the day. But as to our fire notification system, Walpole used to have red fire boxes attached to various telephone poles around town, and each of these boxes had its own number. So you pulled down the lever to report a fire nearby, and when you did, the fire whistles would sound out the number of that box. Once you heard the number, and they would repeat it numbers, a number of times. You could look at your chart found on the backs of the Walpole Annual Reports or in flyers handed out by Herb Lewis Insurance. And I have here an annual report from 1975. And this is your fire chart. And everybody had one of these taped to their refrigerator or um, their basement cellar door, everybody had these. For example, if you heard 385, that would be a fire alarm at Common Street at Ossipee, which is just beyond the high school. Um, 653 was Bird and Son Coal Pocket. Now, I don't know what that is, but it sounds kind of ominous. So, um, in addition to uh, the fire whistles, signaling whistles, um, they sounded them every day at 6.30 a.m. and 6.30 p.m. if you wanted to set your clock. And on a snowy morning, if you had the 6.30 signal, and then another signal following that, that meant it was a snow day. And you could open your door, no matter where in Walpole you were, and listen to the happy screams of school kids up and down the street. So these were important parts of Walpole. Um, and back then, if you were an on-call firefighter, you too would look at your chart and you would head there. But, you know, there were always looky-loos that beat you to it. You know, it's the same everywhere. So the biggest problem as it happened with the on-call volunteer fire departments, well, there were multiple problems. For one, when the whistle blew, some firefighters were out of town or they were busy at work and they couldn't get away or they just didn't want to come. Now later, the state began imposing training and physical fitness requirements, and a lot of these guys just said, I'm not getting a penny for this, so forget about it. So that reduced our number of volunteers willing to continue. So I think we went to a, a full-time professional fire department in, in the late 90s. But on a lovely fall day in 1957, two days before Halloween, 
our on-call volunteer fire department was very much in place and would face one of its biggest challenges ever. The fire whistle sounded the number three, five, seven, and the fire engines raced to a four-story commercial building on South Street. This blaze was destined to explode into a conflagration that consumed homes as well as businesses. The Schaefer Fire, 1957. The Schaefer Fire was so spectacular that it even made the front page of the Boston Globe. The P. Schaefer Company, Inc. once stood on the South Street property where the new police station is. And that whole area was industrial. Nearby, we had the Holiday Coffee Company and other concerns. Now, the Schaefer plant recycled paper and cloth and was chock full of the stuff when one of the paper bales somehow caught fire. I have an eyewitness account of this fire from my husband, John, who was a little kid, about five, living on Lake Avenue. So he heard all the fire trucks and whistles early in the afternoon, and then he trotted up Lake Avenue, crossed Common Street, walked down to South Street, and watched the P. Schaefer Company burn down. Now, if that sounds strange to you, and you're a young person, little kids did that in the 50s. The town was a lot smaller. You pretty much knew everybody in town. And they had taught you in school not to go into a strange car. But by the time John got there, it was quite a terrifying scene. The October 30th Boston Globe reported that the first men on the scene found the upper windows filled with screaming men and women who were threatening to jump. Firefighters from Walpole, Norwood, Westwood, Medfield, Franklin, Milford, Dedham, and other communities sprang into action to help. Through a series of heroic ladder rescues, 20 people escaped the burning four-story building and the nearby houses as the fire raged on, spread by a westerly wind. Walpole on-call firemen John Dalton and the Matson brothers, Fred and Robert, pulled unconscious people out of these buildings and down these ladders with little regard for their own safety. All three of these heroic firefighters were sent afterward to Norwood Hospital, along with three of the rescued women. These three firemen were treated and then came back to the site to continue fighting the fire. The nearby Holiday Coffee plant was scorched but saved by a continuous wall of water provided by the many fire trucks. The Edward A. Sheehan and Sons factory and the General Fiber Company plant were threatened but survived. Also consumed were five loaded trailer trucks and two automobiles parked outside. So while all of this was going on, embers were floating across town and lighting fires in people's yards on Common Street, which they put out themselves with their garden hoses. A few sparks set off small fires at Walpole High School, and members of the football team who were practicing and saw the fire put them out and then came on the run to help. Unfortunately, there were houses alongside the Schaefer plant on Gleason Court, and these two caught fire from the radiant heat. Mr. Daniel Ayagata and Mr. Luigi Santa Marco were lucky only to the extent that their families were rescued before their homes 
burned to the ground. John remembers these men coming up from their shift at nearby Kendall Mills and bursting into tears when they saw their homes on fire. John also recalls that firemen lined Common Street and the far end of South Street with pump trucks and that hose lines were put directly into the Neponset River to put more water on the fire. The line of dozens of diesel pump trucks made a tremendous roar. John remembers stepping over the hoses, he was five years old people, to get a better view and he recalls that soon half the town ended up on South Street to watch the fire. And what a show it must have been. This fire burned all night. Little was left of the Schaefer plant, but a few burnt brick walls. By the time the two blast all clear whistle was sounded the next day, and in spite of the extensive damage and property loss, folks learned that there were no deaths from the Schaefer fire. In all, six people were hurt and hospitalized including the three hero firemen. Six buildings were damaged or destroyed, including three houses on Gleason Court. Now later, the fire marshal reported that the fire had started in a bale of waste paper on the plant's first floor. Of course, the plant had been filled with highly flammable waste paper and cloth. The P. Schaefer Company did not rebuild, but later its trucks still made their rounds around Walpole, picking up waste paper and cloth, at least until their license expired. As this site was cleaned up, the town of Walpole, and this was years before the ecology movement in the early 70s, the town put the bricks in a DPW truck, drove down Lake Ave, and dumped them into Clark's Pond. My father-in-law, whose survival of the Great Depression taught him the value of thrift, promptly grabbed his wheelbarrow and his son, and they loaded it up with bricks. He brought them back to his yard and stacked them up. Over the last 65 years, we've used them for various gardening projects, and we still have a stack of what used to be part of the imposing brick walls of the P. Schaefer Company. The Bird Fires. Everybody in Walpole knows the name Bird, and not too long ago, it was a going concern that manufactured all sorts of roofing and other building materials. Charles Sumner Bird gave our town Bird Park and other members of his family donated memorials, libraries, and other gifts to Walpole and its citizens. Even though the company has been gone since the early 90s, we still have a street and a middle school named for that illustrious family. Along with fame, fanfare, and business success, however, the birds had to deal with fires. Quite a few fires and over quite a few years. Many people in East Walpole worked for Bird and Son. Still more in South Walpole worked at Bird Machine. As I did my historical research into fires at the bird plants, I noticed that there were frequent fires in its mill buildings. Some were started by accident and others by angry ex-employees. But whenever a bird building was lost to fire, they just built another one to take its place. In 1880, Three buildings in the main mill were destroyed and one was damaged. 
Bird employees fought another fierce fire in 1914. According to Firehouse Magazine, the plant was threatened as flames caused by spontaneous combustion ignited a fire that leaped from building to building. Firemen battled the spreading flames and at one point were prepared to dynamite one of the mills to make a fire break. This was not necessary as mutual aid arrived in time and the battle was won. So, town and in-house firefighters have battled blazes large and small at the bird properties. And some of these made Walpole history. So let's remember Bird Mill, Bird Hall, Bird Tech, and finally, Endine. The Bird Mill Fire, 1991. On December 21st, 1991, vandalism by a group of teenage boys led to a fire on the second and third floors of the vacant Bird Mill plant in East Walpole. The fire department was alerted to this blaze by a patrolman working his detail at the four o'clock mass at St. Mary's. The Norwood Fire Department covered for the Walpole firefighters who took six hours to extinguish the blaze. Nobody was hurt, but the fire chief emphasized the danger involved in fighting a fire with a brick exterior and a timber wood interior. He added that there were four or five smaller fires at the same location prior to this one, saying that the police kept chasing the kids away in spite of security measures employed by the building's owners. Bird Hall, 1994. Bird Hall in East Walpole was quite the place. Francis W. Bird, who ran his family business and built his mansion called Endine, built Bird Hall in 1884. He died in 1894, and to commemorate his life, his children built and paid for the Bird Hall Clock Tower, which was attached to Bird Hall. So while Bird and Son was in full force, Bird Hall was the heart of East Walpole's social community. In the 1920s, it featured a moving picture theater, plays, banquets and church services were held on the second floor, a department store and a post office stood on the first. Bird Hall also had a restaurant, primarily for Hungry Bird employees, but open to the general public as well. As you know, in the late 80s and early 90s, Bird closed and its buildings were sold or raised. But the businesses across the street at Bird Hall were still thriving. But the end came for Bird Hall on June the 13th, 1994, when the building burned down. Only Bird Tower was spared. The fire chief said the cause was arson, although no arrests were ever made. I remember the fire quite well because I lost my vacuum cleaner, left at a Bird Hall vacuum repair shop for cleaning. The young man whose shop it was had showed us the only picture he owned of his beauty queen sister, which was hanging on the wall. It went up in flames, along with everything else that young fellow owned. Hollingsworth and Vos, whose plant was right across the Neponset River from Bird Hall, bought the property. As of this filming, the property remains vacant, with Bird Tower the only marker that indicates that, that there was ever a building there at all. But 
there's presently a plan to bring it back to life. And I, for one, hope it happens. The Bird Tech Fire, 1995. Bird Tech was also part of the East Walpole Bird Plant. And on July 5th, 1995, somebody decided to set it on fire. According to the Walpole Times, this 83-year-old building had closed in 1979, and Bird had moved out of the East Walpole site the following year. The fire had been set in the back stairwell. It caught fast because the building was mostly made of wood. Seventy-five firefighters from Walpole, Norwood, Sharon, Rentham, and Norfolk battled the blaze in the heat of summer using two and a quarter million gallons of water right from the Neponset River to quench the flames. This was yet another blow to the memory of Bird and Son, with Bird Hall having been lost only the year before. And Dean, 2000. This beautiful bird family mansion was known as Andine, Gaelic for House on a Hill. It had been built by Francis W. Bird in the 1840s and was expanded five times over the ensuing years. It featured beautiful rooms, a ballroom, servants' quarters and kitchens, gardens, and many different kinds of trees. Charles Sumner Bird lived and died there. His son, Charles Sumner Bird Jr. and his wife both lived there as well, but both had passed away by 1984. After that time, the house and the substantial property surrounding it became owned by Omega Associates, a company chaired by David Bird, who hired caretakers to keep an eye on the vacant mansion and grounds. He even donated its use to the Junior League in 1987 for their decorator show house and garden tour. After that time, its last hurrah, it seems, the house and the gardens fell into disrepair. A builder wanted to put 200 houses on the property. Omega Associates even filed for a demolition permit. I was one of the Historical Commission members who did a site visit to this once great mansion. The place was in bad condition. But nobody had to demolish anything as it happened. The end came for Andine on November 28, 2000, when two young men entered right after the caretaker finished his rounds and set the mansion on fire. They were arrested, having been seen running from the place. It took firefighters from multiple towns many hours to put out the fire, which consumed the entire structure. Over time, the remains of Endine were hauled away. The two individuals, both of whom pleaded guilty to setting the fire, were sentenced to two and a half years each in the House of Correction. Now the builder who had sought permits to put 196 homes on that property before the fire filed a series of lawsuits against the town. After much costly litigation, the town finally gave the necessary approvals and houses appear today where the mansion, all the trees, and the gardens once stood. Historical markers on the top of the hill are the only reminders that Endine ever existed. The Union Training School fires, 1938, 1939. 
The Union Training School, a county truant school for boys, once stood on the summit of Powderhouse Hill, both of which no longer exist. Before we talked about the fire proper, let me tell you about the hill. Now, I will give you a disclaimer. I taught geology for 20 years, and I'm sort of obsessed with glacial formations. And Powderhouse Hill was a hill of glacial origin, probably an Esker or a Came Terrace. And it was huge. It stretched from West Street downtown all the way up to Norfolk Street. It had been around from 10 to 12,000 years. And under its topsoil was a wealth of sand and gravel. And that's why a lot of these hills don't last, because people buy them and set up um, an aggregate mine, and they sell the sand and gravel as a business. For example, the big hole that you go into when you go to Walmart, that was a gravel pit. And it was finally paid out around 1940. So the fact that Powderhouse Hill was gradually taken down was pretty much in line with what many people did in New England. Now Powderhouse Hill got its name in 1773 when Walpole's first powder house was built on its summit. And a powder house, as you must have guessed, was a place where colonial, colonial military men stored their gunpowder. Later, a wealthy Walpole citizen named Squire Miller Fales of our famous Fales family built a retirement mansion on the summit. But he and his wife died before they could enjoy it. So here was this huge hill. Here was this beautiful mansion. And from 1834 to 1883, a gentleman named Dr. Cullis managed a cancer and tuberculosis hospital on the summit. And this was really wonderful of him because regular hospitals did not want these patients. There was no cure for cancer. There was no cure for TB. And these people were going to die. And these hospitals, frankly, needed the beds. But what Dr. Cullis did is he invited them up to Powderhouse Hill, where they had a beautiful place to stay and a beautiful um, view of the Blue Hills and other places nearby as they lived their last days. Now, after Dr. Cullis passed away, in 1885, several counties established a school for truant boys called the Union Training School. Now, these weren't bad boys. They just didn't want to go to school. So as a consequence, county judges would send them to Powderhouse Hill to live and to learn a useful trade in what was once the old Fales Mansion. And they had built another um, group of buildings up there as well. Now, it's said that on Sundays, the boys had to dress in blue uniforms and march in formation with a drummer in front of them down Powderhouse Hill, down to East Street, to the Orthodox Congregational Church to attend church services. After they marched back and during the week, they grew the school's food and attended school whether they wanted to or not. Over the years, fewer boys appeared at the school. And finally, it was closed by the legislature in 1933, you know, the, the deepest part of the Depression. And later, it was abandoned. Now, somebody set a fire up there on Halloween night, 1938. And as you might have remembered from my last film, the Hurricane of 38 had only taken place the month before. So it, it was probably a mess up there of blown down buildings and, 
and trees knocked down. So a big fire occurred up there. Um, many of the buildings, including the Fales Mansion, had already been vandalized and some even razed. On Halloween 1939, somebody else set a match to the remaining buildings and finished the job. It made a spectacular blaze that could be seen from anywhere in the region. In 1944, the entire hill was sold to Dedham Sand and Gravel, and that's the LaRusso family business. Um, that's why the sand and gravel pit on West Street is there. And 40 years later, it was all gone, gradually taken down for the sand and gravel it contained. Swan Pond condos now sit at the base. Everything changes with time. This is Katie Burtwell from the Walpole Historical Commission, hoping you've enjoyed today's episode of Stories of Historic Walpole. Our next episode will be Great Fires, Part 2. Join me again as we count down to the 300th anniversary of the friendly town. Keep watching.